<clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, I hope that uh, you can hear me loudly and clearly and see me clearly. Uh, it, it seems like Matthias is having some uh, technical issues on his end, so I don't know if it's affecting uh, the whole broadcast or not. But <clears throat> we'll do the best we can and hope it works out. Um, well, we're uh, continuing our study on the book of 1 Corinthians, and tonight we're on chapter 7, verse 29. Uh, Renee was not with us last Wednesday. I'm going to uh, read the, the whole chapter quickly uh, to give the context for Renee and everybody, uh, and then we'll pick up the study in verse 29. But before we get started, let me ask Renee and uh, Brother Cripps to say hi. Renee? Hey guys, uh, it's Renee, Roll and Channel the same name, and like everyone on the panel, I contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints, and try to untwist the scriptures people twist up to make you think you got to do something, or uh, have some form of righteousness to either get, maintain, or prove your salvation. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to be back with you guys tonight. Mm -hmm. Happy yes, you're here. We, we, we do miss you when you're not or with us, but... Uh, Thankfully, uh, Brother Dave was able to fill in, and he did an excellent job last Wednesday. So uh, welcome back. Uh, Brother Cripps, say hi. Hey, guys. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> happy, to be, happy to be here. Um, I am, uh, I'm excited about the, uh, uh, the Bible study tonight, and I'm very grateful and thankful to God, and I'm thankful for uh, all the support from uh, everybody that knows uh, my situation and uh, me moving, and that all went very well. I normally start the same way every time, but I just wanted to focus on that. Um, I'm part of True Story Live. Uh, we come on Sunday nights at 9 o'clock. If you uh, haven't heard it, please come over and give a listen. i um, excited that uh, Renee's back with us. Dave did a really good job, but um, it's not the same without Renee, so I'm glad that she's here tonight. Uh, let's get started. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm looking at the chat room, and uh, it uh, I don't see anybody complaining about our audio, so I'm assuming everybody can hear us uh, well. So let's let's begin this study. I'm going to, you know, that we um, uh, are what we call KJV first, uh, and then we like to look at uh, other translations too. But let's start off reading the chapter seven up to to twenty verse twenty nine in the KJV. Uh, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that, that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, 
but now are they holy? But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all the churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one hath, uh, that hath obtained distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, shall, uh, shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. And now verse 29 is where we're picking up. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have had none. Okay, uh, obviously we've already uh, covered all those verses quite thoroughly, but for context, uh, particularly for Renee who wasn't with us last week, Renee, why don't you uh, talk about verse 39 in context with the rest? Yeah, uh, here, here's, here's the only thing. Uh, right, right at 29 is where he starts making another point. He moves from practical living advice on to spiritual matters right here. Everything above that, he's saying, hey, if you're married, you know, what you should be doing to be married. If you're not married, these are your options, et cetera, et cetera. But now he's moving on to the spiritual realm. And this verse and the next two are actually references to um, how ultimately unimportant the earthly situations are, like they're how short lasting these things are. And we'll see that in verse 31. It's kind of, I don't want to go too far ahead, but they kind of work together. So. All right. Uh, do you want to say anything about uh, this, the, this first part of the chapter I just read? And, and before we go uh, forward, just that they're practical advice. And I had mentioned before that the burning there is about burning with lust, you know, burning with fleshly desire. Uh, it's better to get married than to burn in that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't contain mm -hmm. that, then then it's best to just find a life partner. <laughs> okay, uh, let me read uh, 29, 30, and 31 in the Amplified. Brother Cripps, you, then you can give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, 29, beginning with uh, 29, it says, But I say this, believers, the time has been shortened so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they did not, and those who weep, as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice, as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy, as though they did not possess anything, and those who use the world, taking advantage of its opportunities, as though they did not make full use of it. 
see you see what i'm talking about how he's moving on from the everything above is very practical and worldly advice to how ultimately uh it's not saying it really won't make a difference because what we do does determine etern eternality but uh, he's saying it, that the things of this world we should be more focused on the spiritual realm because the the end is coming is kind of what he's saying that It'll be no time and we'll be standing in the presence of God. That, that's what I think he's, he's going for there. Okay. All right. Brother Cripps. Yeah, I, I agree with what Renee said. Um, I also agree, uh, as we discussed last week, uh, kind of where Paul's coming from. And uh, I had mentioned last week, he's definitely coming from the, from the aspect of not being a married uh, man. We talked about that a little bit, about the fact that he probably was never married. We don't know that for sure, I suppose, but these verses sure uh, put up a nice point that he, he's not married. And I'll, I'll say more about that going further. It's just interesting to me. But but uh, I agree that these uh, verses, uh, the verses above were practical, as Renee said, and that these are more spiritual. And the, the, the only point that I want to go with is this last sentence in the King James that says, for the fashion of this world passes away, which makes her point for that these things are tempor temporal. I mean, we've used that word many times, um, that the important things are spiritual. And he's going to go on to make that uh, point even clearer in the next verses. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I, I see that we have a footnote in the Amplified on verse 29. And in the NABRE, we have a footnote on 293031. So let's look at these, these footnotes and see what they have to say. Uh, well, 1 Corinthians 729 in the, in the Amplified says, Paul may be referring to the appointed time of the return of Christ, or he may have been focusing on the briefness of human life, or both of these. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in the in the NABRE, the footnote for these three verses is, uh, the world is passing away. That is, Paul advises Christians to go about the ordinary activities of life in a manner different from those who are totally immersed in them and unaware of their transitoriness. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm. -hmm. mm. So that that ties in a little bit. I was I was making the point that it could be talking about the end times thing. It's interesting that they would see that same thing. It could be both. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's 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 interesting, but why wouldn't they see it? I mean, uh, they, I'm sure <laughs> you know, they have a lot of knowledge and understanding, and Brother Cripps also has a lot of knowledge and understanding. <laughs> why wouldn't you both see see this have this common uh, understanding? I, you took the high road there, Luke. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I don't really have any more to add to to, to, to that uh, in, in these verses. So let's go to verse 32 of the KJV. <clears throat> It says, but I, I would have you without carefulness. Uh, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. In verse 33, it continues, but he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Uh, mm. Well, let me go first on this since I didn't make a comment on the last verses. Uh, uh, it really goes, this is connected to what he's saying earlier about uh, Paul. Uh, we, we talked in the earlier verses and early the studies the last couple of weeks. So Paul's position was that uh, he was unmarried and he says there's a great advantage being unmarried in that you you have uh, all your time is free to dedicate to the Lord and his, and your ministry, but uh, if you are married, then you're obligated to give your wife and children uh, the time that they need, and that means you have less time available for your ministry. However, uh, even though he says it would it'd be great if you could be like him, single and dead, fully dedicated to ministry. If you have these powerful sex, sexual drives that are, are would might make you go into fornication, or uh, and rather than than 
burning with lust and falling into that temptation, you need to get married so that that uh, sexual need can be satisfied within the bounds of marriage. But if you do that, then you're you're uh, not going to be able to give your all to the Lord because your wife or your spouse and your children need some of your time. And now he's back making that point again here in verse uh, 32 and 33 that uh, again making the point that uh, it'd be better if you were unmarried if, if you're unmarried because uh, if you're married you got to think about the world taking care of your family and and uh, uh, worldly things. If you're not married, then you're, you're, you don't have to be thinking about these worldly things like the responsibilities to earn a living and put a roof over their heads and so on. Okay, so uh, Renee, what do you say? Yeah, let me, um, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I think is going on there. Cause he says, uh, I would, I, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord. So he he said it. It was up to me. I tell you, don't be married. Don't have any cares that you got to worry about that have anything to do with the world, so that you can focus completely on what the Lord needs you to do uh, and how you may please Him. But he that married care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife, and and that's true. Uh, so again, the same thing you're saying is that. Uh, your, and it's the right thing to do to give your wife, your children, your time and your financial resources. And these are all very um, uh, godly things to do for your family. Mm-hmm. But Paul is just saying, if you're not married, then you can focus 100 percent on only what God is requiring of you, how you can please him all the time mm-hmm. and not how can I balance this out? You know, mm-hmm. so and it's hard because Jesus said, "Wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also." And that's not; it doesn't mean you're evil because your family is your treasure. You love your family; you'll lay your life down for your family. But that's a very difficult place for a man of God to be, or a woman of God to be, because now there's going to be times where. The Lord may want something of you and it may come in conflict with those that you're also caring for. And I think Paul's just saying to get to, to, to focus only on what God wants of you. It's best. He said, I would have you have no carefulness. I, I would have you have no cares tied to this world. And I think that's what he's saying. Mm-hmm. All right. Let me read it in the Amplified verse 32 and 33. Uh, Brother Cripps, then you can give me your thoughts. Sure. Uh, But I want you to be free from concern. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, uh, how he may please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about worldly things, uh, how he may please his wife. Brother Cripps? Yeah, yeah. Um, It's it's funny. I agree with everything Renee said. Uh, I I, I don't think I have to go on into the... uh, the verses itself and explain what Paul's uh, saying. I think that's done. Um, I disagree with him here, uh, and no, nobody might. Uh, I mean, there may be no uh, no takers on this one, but um, I think that two people that love the Lord and they also love each other uh, can serve God. Yeah, of course, the single person that uh, doesn't have a wife, doesn't have a family, doesn't have all the stuff. Uh, they would have more time. But I think you can serve the Lord through your marriage. It can be an example to other people of, uh, and using verses from Scripture of how you're supposed to treat your wife, how you're supposed to lift her up. I mean, um, Paul himself is uh, strong on verses like this, and there are other verses that talk about how we can do that. I believe it's a gift from God. Um, doesn't mean Paul is wrong, I, but I, I, I don't buy the idea that you can't do that uh, with a wife and with a family, uh, I think I think that we can do that. And maybe I'm just I've, I've got Pollyanna glasses on, but I I see it as a goal to be able to serve God and be able to pay attention to to my wife, my family. Okay. Well, brother, you're you're putting me in an awkward position here. <laughs> do I did I choose to agree with the Apostle Paul or? 
take sides with Brother Pips against, <laughs> against the teachings of Paul. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go with Paul on this. I do understand your position, yeah. and I, there is some merit, but here's the problem. Sure. Uh, now, in, in that, at that time in history, and through much of history until just really the, the last uh, 50 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, it was very, very uh, standard that um, a man would do the, the labor to put a roof over the family's head and provide their food and shelter and their needs, mm -hmm. um, be the, the breadwinner as, as it's he's called. And the wife, would, her responsibility was to uh, raise the children. And that's the way uh, it was then uh, at the time of this writing. And that's the way it's been throughout history until uh, a very recent time in America, things have moved and changed a little bit. Sure. But uh, if you're going to take the position that um, you want the wife to be a full-time mother, and so, the, and she, and and if the wife is going to have children, especially if she's going to have a lot of children, that job is requires uh, all of her time and attention. Yeah, and we, we, I don't think we can expect the wife to be a coworker in in uh, the the husband's ministry. Obviously, she should be supportive, but if she got two, three children, or as in my parents, they, they had five. My grandparents, they they had sixteen children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, if you're having a, a more than just one or two children, even if you only have one or two, uh, it is very demanding that if you're going to have a, the, the wife stay home and dedicate all of her time to uh, making sure those children are supervised and taught well and watched over and protected, um, I don't think we should uh, expect her to uh, work in the ministry. Now, if, if in your case, I know what you're thinking, and um, I think you've got... Uh, the possibility of working uh, as co-workers together uh, and uh, but you don't have any young children and that would that would cause the you to say well no i need my wife to be f dedicated to that and uh, i will say this that it is almost a a, a proverb it, it is so common that um, many famous christian ministers uh, at least over the last hundred years that i know of I don't know if any of the ancient, uh, you know, theologians dealt, had this problem or not, but at least I know in this last hundred years, it's very common for a minister to just to be so absorbed in the ministry that the um, uh, the children end up without even a, a parental influence, uh, I mean, a, a, a influence of the father. The father is totally absent, and he's given everything to the Lord and, and nothing to his, his wife and children. It's, it's, it's sad when that happens. And I caution, I've talked to some of the people that, uh, here that I, I work with, uh, uh, that we have to be careful that we're not taking on too much. You, there, you have to take, have some time for your health, for your, your, your wife, your children, and don't try to take on too much in your ministry because you have an obligation, uh, these other obligations too. Well, it also says in the Bible, if a man that doesn't care for his family is worse than an infidel. Yep. Mm -hmm. See, what you're describing, Brother Luke, to me, that's not the way God wants it. I, I, if, if God gives a man a wife and he decides to marry her, he's taking on that responsibility. And part of his ministry is also to his own family. I look at it as everything we do as part of our ministry. It's not some set aside thing like this is the ministry. Like right now I'm doing a ministry thing. Um, uh, it, it doesn't set aside everything. I, I feel like everyone I meet, I'm I'm being a light to the world. And I, I try to look at it like that. Sometimes I fail. But I went to the convenience store today. I tried to be a light. Uh, I consider everything I do as part of a ministry. I, I, I try to not do anything outside of that. Um, I think Paul's situation was different, uh, yeah. Brother Jason, because these people had to leave their families and go to far off countries and even yeah. die. Sure. You know, so I think that's what he's saying. It's better mm -hmm. just to not be an encumber because you don't know when you're going to get back ever. To yeah, your yeah. yeah. I, I get that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's see uh, if there's. I don't think there's any footnotes on that. And uh, let me see, 29. 
No, no footnotes to look at. So unless you have more to say, I'll go back to the KJV. No, no. For, 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 for verse um, 34. Um, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Hey, Renee. Yeah, I think it's just saying the opposite of what it said a minute ago, because the husband's going to be worried about pleasing the wife. And now the wife's going to be worried about pleasing the husband. You're just saying mm -hmm. your focus is going to be on taking care of them and not 100% on the Lord. To make your life easier, it's probably best just to choose to not be married at all. If, <laughs> you know, to be an apostle or a disciple or something. I think that's where he's going with it. It's just sure. easier, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah the, uh, I think Paul is being going out of his way here to be very fair and apply this standard to both husband and wife. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Cripps, you, you want to say anything about that? All right, I mean, Renee hit on it. I mean, it's it's clear, and I love that Paul does this. Again, we've seen this uh, time, time again. He, um, he'll he say something one way, and then he'll flip it, and then say it another way to get his point across. And, and sometimes it seems like he's being repetitive, going over the same stuff. And again, I'm, my answer for that is always the same. And that's that um, he wanted people to understand it. He wanted us to understand. I believe God wants us to understand where Paul's coming from today. And I certainly do. Uh, I just think that you can still have a desire to to, to please the Lord and still be in a family. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I, I'm just going to say um, uh, maybe I'm wrong, and I'm not saying that you should listen to me instead of uh, a, Apostle Paul. Uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that I put upon myself – the desire to, uh, even though I'm in a relationship, to still do ministry stuff and still have it be important to me. Of course, I know that it's going to be divided in some ways. Um, lastly, I, I I do agree with uh, Brother Luke. He's uh, giving the same deference to the women and the men, the men to the women. So that's good. Yeah, yeah I wanted to touch on that, Brother Luke. I, I learned something based on what was happening historically within these churches. Um I learned some of this from Sister Paula and from research. The reason that he does flip flop, hey, the wife should do this and the husband should also do that, is because she said in some places the women weren't even caring. They just stopped caring for the things they were supposed to take care of. And then also the men were the ones that had to be reminded that they are supposed to remain faithful to their wives as well. Like That's it was always understood that the woman had to be faithful. That's incredible. Stoned, but the men had to be reminded to be faced. So she was letting me know there was a double standard going on, but also what was happening in the first century church. Yeah. So would often remind equal partners of their responsibilities. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Now, See, it's um, still a problem. In the, uh, in the KJV, it refers to... Uh, the, between a wife and a virgin, and um, all that's all that really means is that the assumption is yeah. that if you are not married, you must be a virgin. You're, yeah. it, it's expected if you're not married, you are a virgin. Mm -hmm. And it, and it and, and if we look at it in the Amplified, uh, let me see. It just means uh, never been married. The unmarried woman or the the virgin. Yeah. So an unmarried woman is, is when you say he says virgin, it means you're unmarried because you're assuming that a virgin is unmarried and uh, and uh, an unmarried woman must it must be a virgin. Mm -hmm. um, so the unmarried woman or the virgin is concerned about the matters of the Lord, how to be holy and set apart both in body and in spirit. But a married woman is concerned about worldly things, how she may please her husband. Um, yeah, and and I think that. Um, Brother Cripps, um, this is not uh, requiring anybody to take some absolute position. I think I think it's really Paul really wants us to understand that it's a matter of degrees. Uh, if you're married 
you still have a ministry. Every believer has a ministry. I've said this a hundred times. I hope people be, will believe this and accept it and adopt it and, 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 uh, and work at it. If you're a believer, you are a minister. That means a servant. I know how, how well are you serving? That's the question. I don't know, but, but you are designated as a minister or a servant. once you believe, mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, so it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to do a ministry uh, if we're married. It doesn't mean that we're not able to do a ministry if we're married. It, it just means that you're not going to have as much time available for ministry because some time is necessary to give to your family. Sure. Sure. I get that. All right. Let's go back to the KJV. Uh, the verse 35 says, <clears throat> And, and this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Okay, Cripps? Yeah, and I, I appreciate that point. Verse 35, he, he's making the point that you're making. He's just saying, serve the Lord without distraction. And He's making the point that if you have a husband or you have a wife and you have a family, as you were talking about, Brother Luke, it's a distraction. Uh, I get that. And he's trying to make it easy for everybody. And his point is his point is clear. And um, I, I, I understand what he's trying to say. Uh, and I think you're right. He's not he's not placing a certain level and saying it's got to be like this. Um, and also, as Renee said, it was a completely different time. I still think women are uh, demarginalized in our society. Uh, maybe not to the extent that it was back then, for sure. Um, but it's they're still struggling. They're still struggling with that and not being held uh, on the same uh, level playing field with men. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, each person has to decide uh, the best mm -hmm. way to do it. And if I'm going to do a ministry, I'm not responsible for what all the other ministers do, and I'm not calling myself that. Yeah. Uh, I'm only responsible for me. I'm going to try to, to 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 still please the Lord, even if I'm married. Yeah. Well, t t to me, getting back to practical use for Brother Cripps today and for everybody else today, uh, I, I think the the biggest factor is: uh, are you are you equally yoked? Is your spouse a believer? Is your spouse spouse passionate for ministry equally to you? Uh, then then you could be co-workers, uh, provided they're not children that uh, that need uh, the attention of at least the mother. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, yeah, I'd say in your case, there is no reason why uh, being being married uh, was going to be any restriction at all, assuming that your wife is equally zealous for yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Uh, Renee, let me read this in the uh, Amplified, verse 35, for, and then you can give me your thoughts. Now I say this for your own benefit, not to restrict you, but to promote what is appropriate and secure, undistracted devotion to the Lord. Yeah, um, I I think the main uh, point there is... Uh, that he, he said he's not trying to cast a snare upon him. So he's not trying to trap him. I mean, his point is, not, I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm not trying to trap you. I'm not trying to say, go this way or go that way. Or you're doing something wrong if you're going this way. But I'm only saying this for your own profit. And that uh, do what's best. Do what's best so that you can. Whatever your situation is. Just do your best so that you can attend to put upon the Lord without distraction. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back to the KJV for verse uh, uh, 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. <laughs> Can you unravel that, Renee? Yeah, um, yeah. The, when he's saying his virgin, he's talking more like a caretaker, like a father. Like if uh, somebody cares for an unmarried young girl, and she is past the age of being able to marry. When it says behaves himself uncomely, it means that he is not taking her interest at heart 
and he may be making her wait too long. She'll be an old maid if she's 17 and not married, you know? So he's saying if, <laughs> if you don't, if, if she's at a certain age and she wants to be married, you're not doing any sin by offering your daughter for marriage. You're not sinning because you're not, because, because, he doesn't want anybody to take his words wrong in thinking that he's against marriage and that if you don't abstain from marriage, that somehow you're not committed to God. You know, he's saying, I'm, I'm not saying that. And that doesn't mean that if you have a virgin daughter that you shouldn't give her in marriage, you're not sinning if you give her in marriage, you're not doing anything against the Lord if you give her away in marriage. So he's trying to comfort the fathers and caretakers of young unmarried girls, uh, lest they feel that they're doing something wrong by giving her away in marriage. So that's why uh, I think that's why it says if a man thinks he behaves himself uncomely towards his virgin, and if needs require, let him do what he will. He sins not, let them marry. That doesn't mean the virgin he's going to be married to is the virgin he cares for under his care as a, as a paternal figure. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I really, uh, I have to admit, by the way, I'm going to go uh, this weekend to uh, Cedar City, Utah. Every summer, uh, they have a Shakespeare festival all summer long. So um, we're, as a family, we're going to go and, uh, and see some Shakespeare. And um, Shakespeare in English is not exactly KJV, but it's similar and it's uh, kind of hard to understand. Uh, but I don't mind admitting that uh, when I read this verse in the KJV, it's like a puzzle to me. Uh, I, but I, when I read it in the Amplified, it's very clear. So, Brother Cripps, let me read it in the Amplified for you, and then you can respond. 36 in the Amplified says, But if any man thinks that he is not acting properly and honorably toward his virgin daughter by not permitting her to marry, if she is past her youth, and it must be so. Let him do as he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I think that helps us out. You just, uh, I think Renee hit on it too, and the amplified uh, backs her up um, for the for the father exactly. Uh, you know, don't don't uh, frustrate your daughter if she wants to marry someone and she's at the marrying age. Um, even after everything he's just said about serving the Lord, if she wants to, then go ahead and, you know, uh, let her marry. That's not a sin. Just as he was saying in the verses above that, you know, if you want to, you want to get married, it's not a sin, but, uh, you know, it's better if you don't, it's just still the same point Paul's making. Hey, I had to read it a few times, you guys, in King James to get it right. My, I had to shut my eyes and try to think about what was just said because yeah. I was like, wait a minute see you can't be talking acting uncomely towards a virgin he's gonna marry he wouldn't encourage somebody to marry someone that can't control themselves or he can't be saying that so like it took me a minute and I made a King James version it would have been it would have been nice if they would have implied that it was yeah. in order because it would you know, but it took me several times of reading it before it, it, it got through to my brain that it's probably talking about a, a virgin under the care of someone and him giving her away. Yeah, his yeah. virgin. <laughs> it takes a minute, though. It is not. It well, is. I'm, I'm with you, brother. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things you're really good at, Renee. Honestly, this is one of the things you're good at. It's impressive. Um, and, but the word in the sentence toward his virgin, that, that kind of uh, bears it out a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be at somewhat a dating situation. It wouldn't be uh, toward your version. Right, yeah. right, right, right. I didn't want to let Brother Luke know. I, I get it because I, I get that too sometimes. I'm like, it takes mm -hmm. me a couple of readings or I get through it. Too. Yeah. Well, here in the Amplified, I'll read it again and make a point. It says, but if any man thinks that he is not acting properly and honorably toward his virgin daughter. Yeah. And then in parentheses, that means by not permitting her to marry. Mm -hmm. So it's not acting improperly in terms of the father is molesting his daughter, as right. some might jump to the conclusion. Right. It's saying by not permitting her to marry, that would be improper, not yeah. allowing your daughter to marry. Right. Uh, because if she is past her youth, 
it, like say so uh, it, there's a certain age and she's she wants to get married and, and the father's not permitting it but she's starting to get a little old yeah uh, let's look at the footnotes there are a couple of interesting footnotes well they were here. old maids like i said at 17 back then yeah well in the in the footnote in the na and then um amplified in verse 36 says um no in ver verse yeah it says um in ancient times, marriages were usually arranged by a girl's father or the head of the family and um, uh, has reached her childbearing years. In other words, it means that uh, she's reached her childbearing years. And then we look at the, the footnote in the uh, NABRE, uh, verse 36 through 38. No, no, 36. It says, a critical moment has come either because the woman will soon be beyond marriageable age or because their passions are becoming uncontrollable. Hmm. So either reason, either, either the woman's getting too old and not, not, she's not going to be able to get a husband past a certain age, I guess, uh, or her, her passion, she's starting to burn, as Paul says, uh, with, with her uh, sexual desires, and she, she needs to get married, and fathers don't don't for, forbid that and hold her back. Okay. Okay, any more on that before I go back to the next verse on the KJV? No, I think you made it clear. It was good. Okay. All right, let's go to verse 37 in the KJV. Oh. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. <laughs> okay, Crips. Crips, un un decipher that for me. Well, let's let's use the 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 key that Renee gave us in talking about it being the father and the amplified uh, says that as well. So now he's saying, dude, if you can keep your your daughter, your virgin daughter, from marrying. You know, if you if you have it set in your mind, steadfast in your heart, um, have the power over your own will in order to uh, coax her or convince her or whatever, um, then you do it well. I mean, good job. And I think he understands how difficult that might be, at least. But again, he's coming from the standpoint of never having been married. I don't think that's too far of an assumption. Yeah. Well, I'll read it in the Amplified, and then okay. Renee, uh, you can respond. It says, but the man who stands firmly committed in his heart, having no compulsion to yield to his daughter's request, and has authority over his own will, and has decided in his own heart to keep his own, his own virgin daughter from being married, he will do well. Yeah, uh... I, I think the word keep here is in reference to financial keeping uh, because it, it to, to make uh, authority over his will, it seems like he's going to provide for her for her lifetime because if, if it would be wrong for a father to keep his daughter from getting married when she can bear children and then say 10 years later, well, I'm going to stop financially caring for her because, and now she can't have a husband or children. That would be totally horrible of him to do that. So authority of his own will in a way, I think is not more about his will as in his willpower, but his will, his say, financial resources, his, like he's going to care for her. This is something they've decided. Hey, uh, if you don't want to get married, uh, I think you shouldn't get married and I'll take care of you the rest of your life. You can inherit my property. So now you don't have to worry about it. And now they can both focus on the Lord. That's an option too. But I really think that is more in line with um, uh, him promising to care for her for her lifespan. Yes, I think you're right. When it says keep her, it just means keep her under his own house being, and he's, he's being responsible for taking care of her as he did up to as she was a child. He's st still keeping her and, and uh, providing for her. Um, but you remember now that um, maybe some people aren't aware of this, 
But up until this this current time in America, in America and in other places around the world, it, there's a lot of places around the world they still ha still do not uh, the the, the uh, um, standard is that a, a woman is not going to be able to provide for herself. Uh, they uh, they need to marry to have a provider, and obviously um, there were even. Uh, uh, um, contractual considerations, dowries, and things like that, and, and these uh, arranged marriages, and uh, obviously uh, the the man wanted to get an ideal wife and marry into a good family, and the wife wanted to get a husband that had some wealth and could, could actually take care of her, uh, and she so she doesn't marry someone that's poor. So uh, a man who is poor is is really quite. Uh, uh, sad situation for him. He better get successful, or he's not going to be able to find a wife. Maybe, um, but now um, many women over the last fifty years have become completely independent, and they don't have the the, the need. It's not necessary that they have a man to provide for them. Uh, and again, everybody's going to have to have their own judgments whether that's uh, you know uh, the right thing or not. But um, uh, it is it is a new idea relatively in, in world history as far as I know that throughout history a woman's uh, best chance in life to get ahead was just to, to marry a man that uh, can provide for her yeah. uh, all right uh, any more on that before I go on to another verse nope okay uh, okay Let me see. Verse 39. Uh, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Brother Cripps? Uh, yeah, that's he, he said that before in different ways. The wife, but when he was talking about the marriages, they're bound by the law as long as your husband liveth and the uh, husband be dead. Um, the, the part that I'm not quite sure of, only in the Lord to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Um, it's probably stretching my brain more than it should. Well, the Amplified says, only provided that he is too in the Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, okay, that, that clears it up then right there. So the yeah. person that she married, as long as, long as uh, he's in the Lord. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. All right, Renee? Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's obvious, but it's also... Um, uh, it's kind of a picture, too, of the law versus grace. You know, he uses that example of being espoused to one husband, and then yeah. once the husband dies, you're no longer married to that bondage. You're not under the bondage, but you're free. Um, and uh, so every time, even if he's not talking about that, I always get taken back to that part where, you know, once you're free from the husband, <clears throat> you're, you're free to be you're out from, out from under that bondage. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, let's look at verse 40 in the KJV. Renee, it says, but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the spirit of God. Did you ask me that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think he's saying I'm speaking on my own behalf, but I also believe God's in agreement with me on that. <clears throat> yeah, we said that earlier too in this chapter. Yeah. But he, he clearly says some things are not uh, inspired by God, that they, they are his thoughts. Yeah, uh, but the, the Amplified says, but in my opinion, a widow is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I also have the spirit of God in this matter. Yeah. So uh, he's he's saying that not only is is his opinion, but he thinks God agrees that if you're a widow, you're going to be better off just remaining a widow. That's what he's saying. 
Yeah. Not not saying I agree, but there it is. Oh well, yes. Okay. Well, I don't know what else is, we could say about that. No. Having no. never been married, I agree with Paul in everything. <laughs> <laughs> You would, Renee. You would. <laughs> no, I see how happy some people are, like when they marry. I'm all for marriage. I just, I knew I wasn't. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't capable of giving what was needed. And that's okay. Look, that's okay. Uh, you know, and I think Paul makes a point right. of saying, "Look, if you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, that's right. fine too." But here's my here's my point. Right. You can serve the Lord better if you don't. Right. I mean, that is the point. And Renee, I, God bless you that you know uh, yourself well enough to know that for you, marriage uh, isn't something that you're interested in. Right. At this point. right, right. And that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, I don't think that people should look at people that want to be married like me. I do want to be married. I've experienced both. And uh, I will not be, as Brother Luke was saying earlier, I will not be unequally uh, yoked with uh, someone that, that doesn't believe. Um, I, I, uh, I, I won't let that happen again. And I, I, it's, it's not just that I want to prove that it can be successful, but I look at the Bible in a completely different way than I did back then. And I think it can be done. So it, it's not to look down on people that decide yeah, they want to be married. I agree with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, um, we've got plenty of time to continue on into the next chapter. So let's move to chapter eight. Um, and in the KJV, chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puff, puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Uh, Brother Cripps, you want to go first on that? Well, sure. It's great. It's a great verse. Um, so this he's getting back into this thing he's talked about before, about idols and all that and so back then that was still a big deal people thinking that um you know once the ban on the on the, uh you know uh pork and all that stuff was uh lifted um so to speak uh in the spiritual idea of uh, preaching to the gentiles now after just been the hebrew people um he's making this point again um but the one that i want to concentrate on his knowledge puffeth up because this is he he's saying one thing about food offered idols and that's kind of a, a temporal thing i'm probably not using the right word but then he goes to a spiritual thing in my opinion knowledge puffeth up and charity edifieth and charity and love are a similar thing we all know that um so he he's to me he's advising that that knowledge uh um is not useful in the same way that charity is. And I, I would agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, the, um, I'll read it in the Amplified. It says, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge concerning this. Mm -hmm. Knowledge alone makes people self-righteously arrogant Mm -hmm. But love that unselfishly seeks the best for others builds up and encourages others to grow in wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that uh, he's going to, he is referring to self righteous condemning of others. Yeah. Like the so and so's family, they eat this offered. I, you know, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. that you see. I also believe this is in reference to. Uh, Jewish believers that have converted who know the law. They have knowledge of the law. They have knowledge that the pagans out there were unclean. But we don't have to be reminded of the law. We have all that knowledge of what the law says is nothing. And like uh, Brother Jason says, you know, we see this a lot with Hebrew rooters. They come at us like we've never seen this stuff before. Yeah. <laughs> really? That's in my Bible? I was wrong. Let me repent. <laughs> oh, my you know, gosh. They, they, they want to, uh, same thing with the sacred namers. You don't pronounce it correct. You know, everybody's got knowledge, right? Yeah. And all it ever does is separate people. Yep. But oh my gosh. Does bring them together. And it's important what you said there, Jason, 
knowledge puffs up because you can have I know guys that can memorize the Bible, tell you where the verses are. They have zero revelation of it, though. Yeah. But they got the knowledge, and yeah. they'll let you know quick. All the knowledge. They know the history of the church. They know all the doctrines. They know all the founding yeah. fathers. They can tell you exactly what's what in what verse and where it's found. Yep. Yeah. But they they uh, they have no like uh, Christ like love compassion or grace nope you're absolutely so right I think paul is reminding us you know knowledge is good and we all have knowledge on here so there's no need to go i know this and you don't know that we all have knowledge on it so let's not focus on if the jewish guys know it and the and the former pagans don't know it we're not i'm, I'm thinking i'm i'm feeling there might have been some division because of those who knew the law versus those that didn't Right, because not the hearers of the law, but doers only are justified, and there are no doers. He's just saying there's no doesn't benefit you to be a Jew is all he's saying because they heard the law. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's important here that that it's less important about what you know, more about who you know, because that's going to come manifesting through love and charity, like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um this idea of um, knowledge puffing up, but charity or love edifieth, um, that he's, he's applying it to this particular issue of um, um, touching thing, things offered to idols, but we could broaden that and, and apply knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth to everything else it, 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 the same rule applies to every everything that's uh comes into question uh, and when you say you know people renee like that i think we all know people like that oh uh, yeah that uh they they really are well read and they they uh, really uh, have a vast uh, repertoire and can reference uh, scriptures and uh, all theological subject matter, they can talk about it, but uh, the unfortunately, sometimes the more people learn, the more prideful they get or puffed up. Um, and um, it's nice, uh, and, and I can name some people. Uh, matter of fact, I recommended uh, David Benjamin in Christ uh, recently in, an, uh, in a video, and uh, here's there's somebody that I think, by the way, I'm if you, he made a very kind video about me today. If you haven't seen it, but uh, it uh, here's someone that I respect who is uh, really well uh, well learned in the scriptures and in church history and in theology, uh, brought in a broad sense, and, and yet uh, uh, I still see that this not being puffed up, but, but you know having the charity and the love, as Paul says that you know uh, faith, hope, and and charity or faith, hope, and love, but uh, greatest is love. Yes. Without love, without love uh, you know, everything else means means nothing. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, whether it's uh, the, the question of uh, things offered to idols or anything else, this is a this is true that when some people they get very knowledgeable. Uh, I think that we're all pretty knowledgeable, Renee, Cripps, Matthias, myself, and and every, the others who who, who are. Uh, uh, you know, participating in these uh, talks, uh, and yet uh, I'm not seeing people puffed up and being arrogant. And I, I'm seeing love and and uh, so let, read it. I'll read it in the Amplified as now about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all have knowledge concerning this. Knowledge alone makes people self righteous uh, er and arrogant, but love that is that unselfishly seeks the best for others builds up and encourages others to grow in wisdom. So that's what we should be doing instead of trying to show that we are superior to someone else in our knowledge and always wanting to correct them. See, that's one of the things I like about our our congregation and our panels um, is that uh, um, when we disagree, we state it and we state it as, as politely as we can but then we do not try to impose our position on the others. We're not trying to, okay, now I'm going to try to win an argument and prove my proof that I'm right and they're wrong. No, we just present another point of view and, and hey, uh, hey, sometimes viewers, 
you may get three or four different viewpoints on, on a question. And, and uh, we're not trying to prove who's right or wrong. We're just saying, consider all these different points of view. It's all, we're just offering it all for your consideration. We're not presenting it to you as a dogma that uh, I'm, I'm, I can't be wrong and, and you have to agree with me. We're just saying, here's a variety of viewpoints on this, a variety of interpretations on this scripture here and uh, for you to consider. Yeah. Um, all right, let's look at uh, verse two in the KJV. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. Brother Cripps? Uh, as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice, we know that I know is nothing in the world. Yeah. Um, the the point's been made that what what were they called before idols? They they speak not, they move not, they uh, they I mean they're they're nothing. Uh, we know that. We know that they've been worshipped for uh, forever for a long long time by others, and they're still worshipped today, just a different way. Um, they're nothing in the world. Uh, the only the only God we need is our God, the God of the Bible. Um, we don't need to uh, worry about all this other stuff. There's none other than God. Yeah, he's he's just making that point clear. And again, he's speaking to believers, so they should all know that. But I think with all this other talk, he's coming back around to the point that he's made so many times in his letters. God is the, the most important thing in every situation. And he bore it out in the last chapter as well about saying, putting God first and even over marriage and everything else. Um, so he's just making the same point here to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Renee, uh, verse two, verse two. Yeah. I like when uh, he says that if a man think he knoweth uh, anything, he knoweth nothing yet yeah. he ought to know. Cause he said, if a person actually thinks they are at a place where they know something, they actually don't know what they ought to know. And that's God and his heart. Because yeah. Uh, I, I think that's where he's going there. You're, you're going to be puffed up in every and all your knowledge tells me that you actually don't know anything because what you ought to know is that God uh, prefers love in all things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I've said this and, I, and I've heard other people uh, say the same thing you know, that um, I, I, None of us are pretending that we're omniscient and that we, we, we know we really understand every scripture. No. Uh, we uh, we're, will be willingly admit that there's a, there, there are um, the, the, the doctrine of uh, the person of Jesus and uh, the free gift of, of, of salvation. This I'm absolutely certain. I have absolute confidence. I'm certain of this. All other theology, then I have very degrees of confidence. In some some th theology and some verses, I have no idea. Uh, and I really cannot even take a stand. I don't have any confidence uh, in, in uh, telling you what it means. And so uh, I think it is important for us to recognize that uh, nobody, I, I made a video titled, um, I'm, uh, I'm seeking a new Bible teacher. I remember Matthias w was disturbed when it came out. He, 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 I don't know if it's disturbed, but he was, uh, he, he says he was wondering what in the world is he talking about? Is he uh, not happy with the uh, Church of Eternally Secure uh, congregation and he needs to, need to find somebody else? Or, uh, well, uh, no, I was just trying to make the point that uh, I, I want to have a Bible teacher who understands and uh, every verse of the Bible perfectly. Is there anybody out there like that? If you if you are, come and teach me. Uh, but obviously, it was it was um, satire because uh, I know that nobody does, and yet some people we know that's the way they come off. It's like there is no possibility that they could be wrong in any of their positions. And I think that's what's happening here in these verses here, talking about being puffed up with knowledge and, and, and uh, that um, they not only do not understand that they, as it says here, uh, 
if any man thinks that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing. So, you know, if someone really is that confident that they got it all figured out, that's just, Paul said, you really don't know anything because you're, it's, you're all puffed up with pride and arrogance. And, and, uh, uh, and, and then usually what accompanies that attitude is this arrogance and, uh, you know, a lack of love and that they want to criticize and condemn others who disagree with them instead of having a loving attitude. Well, let me tell you how I see it and, and consider this point of view instead of saying, that, hey, you're, a, you're a heretic and uh, we're going to have to expose you now. <laughs> yeah. All right. I wouldn't know yeah. anything at all about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you're you're so blessed that you've never been exposed. Except I saw I saw someone expose you yesterday. I think it was it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, someone, some, someone named uh, uh, Renee. The Melchizedek issue yeah. still going on and on about that, and of course, uh, uh, perishing versus torment. Yeah. 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 And because somebody said my favorite band was Metallica, which is not. Yeah. Oh, I, really like uh, I wanted to I wanted to tell you something, but uh what? remind me remind me if you don't have to rush off immediately after the program is over. I wanted to say something to you about the eternal sonship or uh, question uh, before you make okay. your video. Okay. okay. Uh all right, let's uh let's move on to the next verse. Verse three in the KJV says but if any man love God, the same is known of him. Mm. Chris? Yeah, if you love God, uh, he knows you. You know, you're in a relationship. And that that's um, antithesis to the verse that talks about those that stand before him. And they say, well, didn't we do this? And didn't we do that in your name and cast out demons in your name, blah, blah, blah. And he says, I didn't, never knew you. So this verse, looking at that in context, so it's saying, but if any man love God, truly love him, uh, the same is known of him. So there's a relationship. Gnosko, I think, is the Greek for it. I don't, I don't usually get into that, but I think that's the word. It's uh, a different type of knowing. It's a, rela a relationship between the two. It's not just doing things and saying, uh, oh, yeah, this is for God. It's, it's tight. You know, it's a relationship loving relationship between God and, and uh, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in the KJV, it says, but if any man love God, yeah. Uh, but in uh, the Amplified, uh, Renee, I think you think they might be reading too much into this. The Amplified says, but if anyone loves God, that is with all filled reverence, obedience, and gratitude, <laughs> he is known by him as his very own and is greatly loved. Mm. Uh, Renee, your audio is broken up now. When you start adding obedient, Renee, 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 can you hear me? Your audio is really broken up right now. Maybe you ought to leave and come back. Can you? Can you hear me? No, I'm, I'm only hearing every other. I'm only hearing every other word. Okay. Okay, she'll come back. She yeah. can. She can finish. All right, uh, Crips. Uh, how about? How yeah, about, I'll, I'll comment. I'm going to steal her thunder, though. I know what she's going to say. She's going okay. to say that when you add the, she was trying to say what well, the bits and pieces when you add the obedience to it. It's like you're tacking something else on there that's that's not implied. Um, to me, the way the King James phrases it, you don't need to imply anything else. It's saying, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. It's the mm -hmm. it's the knowing him thing. We're not adding a bunch of stuff to the list. We've got to do this, this, and this, and this. Mm -hmm. um, so my my, I would disagree with the, the terms used in addition to, I know their job is to amplify, but I think they are going too far, Brother Luke, honestly. Yeah, uh, well... Going too far, it might not be the right way of explaining it because that's what they're doing. They're amplifying. Amplifying yeah. means you're, you're expounding upon it. Uh, as we yeah. are doing, each one of us, as we explains our, gives our interpretation, we're amplifying, expounding on it. And, yeah. and, uh, but it's not going too far. It's just the, the idea of 
does love really mean that? Does love mean um, our reverence, obedience, and gratitude? Um, well, the obedient part is the one that uh, that I think is a red flag for us. Yeah. That obedience, uh, we're, we're kind of sensitive to... Um, uh, the modern translations, when they when they insert the idea of obedience into it, then uh, that's where they tend to go wrong, uh, associating that if you love God, you'll, you'll be obedient. If you're truly saved, you'll be obedient. Yeah. And uh, that's the mistake that we see commonly in the modern translations. I'll read it in the Amplify, I mean, in the, in the NABRE, verse 3 says, But if one loves God, one is known by him. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's simple. They leave uh, it alone, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's the same as the KJV. Mm -hmm. uh, is there all right. A is there a footnote for that one? That'd be interesting. Uh, you know, let me let me look and see. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Seems pretty pretty simple. I could have sworn that you said gone did the amplified go too far. That's why I commented in that way. I thought that you had actually said that. Did yeah, I, I did. I did ask the question. Okay. Now. Okay. Okay. Right. So uh, it is. Uh, it, 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 they're they're um, they're going too far in the respect that they're uh, inserting uh, obedience, associating obedience yeah. with love. When I I can accept that um, loving that uh, we would have reverence and um, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. It says reverence, obedience, and gratitude, and um, I, I don't. Uh, well, if you have obedience, I mean, what degree of obedience does it have to be? One hundred percent obedience. I mean, if yeah. that's the case, then we all we all miss the mark there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've okay. made that point too on on this show before and in your playlist. You made that point. I mean, what's the level? I mean, it's yeah. part of the whole liberty thing. What's the level that a person has to go to? And I agree with it. I think I, you know, there. The level's perfection. So if you can't do perfection in and of yourself, then that's the level, and we don't have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I hope Renee's able to get back with us. But let's go on. To, let's go on to verse four in the KJV. Okay. Um, let me look at the chat room real quick just to see if uh, there's any issues with the. Uh, it's still cooking. I mean, the, yeah. the, the chat's still going on and on. And yeah, you, so there's nobody okay. complaining about uh, the, it's broken up and no audio, so I'm assuming everybody can still understand us. There there she is. Hey, Renee. Hey, guys. See if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. perfect yeah. Now. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Uh, do you want to respond to that uh, point in the, in the yeah. where it says about uh, loving God means that uh, you have uh, um you're uh, obedient yeah, yeah. Well, that's vague because mm -hmm. how, how do i know if i love god if yeah if my how do i know my obedience is enough to prove i love god yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that's adding to god's word if i ever saw it because what they're really trying to do is disqualify carnal believers yeah they're trying to say hey if you're not obedient and you don't keep his commandments and what, like they do that perfectly, then you're not really saved and you're not a real Christian. Yeah. That's all they're trying to do. That's the bottom line. That's what most people are teaching. When when I find it ironic, because I don't think most of those people are even in the body of Christ. Yeah. I don't think they've ever even believed the gospel ever. Right. But because if any man love God, the same is known of him. Mm -hmm. And so uh yeah, it says there's a place in the old testament where that uh, when we trust in God, we are known of him. Mm -hmm. like he knows us. But I think the same, it's not just if any man love God, the same God is known of him. Mm -hmm. uh, like God knows of him. Yeah. You know, I think is that uh, the same is known of him, that, that of the one that loves God, it will be known that they love God because they love others too. Yeah. It's going to be known of the person that loves God. I think that's what that's saying. Yeah. If any man love God, the same is known of him. Say it's not just that God, uh, uh, the same is known of him. So uh, if you love God, then it's going to be known of you that you do love God. Yeah. I well, think that's what it's saying. 
John John would agree with that. First John four seven and eight, I believe. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, because God is love. That's why I'm, I'm really sick in my gut over all these people preaching hate against Israel, hate against gay people, hate. Look, there, it's just they exclude like this people with this one thing. Like it's just. A way, it's just an excuse to hate people and they say, no, I'm zealous of righteousness. No, you're not because you're not righteous or you'd be perfect in your life. You know, I'll just laugh at that. But it's just another way to hate. And that's never of God. They take stuff in the Old Testament, not understanding that was supposed to make us guilty to yeah. show us how wicked we are, not to show us how right we are against everybody else. Yeah. I mean, it's just doing the opposite, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm going to read verse four, five, and six together. It's one, really one continuous thought. Uh, uh, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Okay, uh, Sister Renee? Four, five, and six in the KJV. Yeah, Paul is Paul is trying to confirm that although there are idols offered to other gods and other lords and other deities, that there is only one true God. He's saying just because we acknowledge that these entities are being sacrificed to doesn't mean that we acknowledge that they're on God's level. Boom. And, And uh, I also want to remind people that everything's got to be taken in context because I saw someone take this verse and say, see, there is no, there's nothing behind idols, but there are, there's devils, devils behind idols. It tells us that when they sacrifice to idols, they sacrifice to devils. That's right. So the big deity that they would draw, uh, you know, was usually a territorial deity a territorial or a principality yep. and then they would make tiny idols they would put in their homes to invite that demonic thing into their house oh my goodness yes and make offerings to it so if he's not saying that there isn't a spiritual entity attached to it he's just saying they're not gods you shouldn't worship these things as gods there's only one god yeah so um uh i wanted to be clear on that because people will take isolated things like this and and not see the rest of the scripture on it but um so it says but the under is but one god the father of whom are all things and we and him and one lord jesus christ by whom are all things there you go there's your creator again Mm -hmm. by whom are all things and we by him Howbeit there is not every man that knowledge for some with conscience of the idol under this hour eat as if a thing offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Did I go too far? Uh, it's uh, f- three verses, uh, four, five, and six. Oh, four, four, five, five and six. Okay. All right, then I'll, I'll stop. But that was his main point. Okay, I'll, I'll read those four, five, or six in the Amplified Crips. Uh, Sure. In this matter, then, of eating food offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. It has no real existence, Mm -hmm. and that is, uh, there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things, and we exist for him and Mm. one lord jesus christ by whom are all things Mm. that have been created and we believers exist and have life and have been redeemed through him Mm. yeah verse six is the one right there i mean you could just focus on verse six that's it um that's the point 
And um, I was starting to wonder when uh, Paul was going to get back to referring to our Lord Jesus. <laughs> he said, <laughs> we've done whole chapters where he mentioned him every chapter almost, or every verse, sorry. Uh, so we're back to that again, getting back to the same point as Paul does so well. The point of everything, all of his letters, the point of his whole, entire ministry, the point of him meeting Jesus on the road, the one that he persecuted, was to uh, do everything he could to bring others to him and to uh, uphold the idea of what uh, true repentance is and a relationship with him. That's what he continues to do. And the idols are nothing. And I'll double down on what Renee said about the idols. Yes, they're demonic things behind the idols. The idols themselves are chunks of wood or whatever. Um, but the way she characterized it, that's exactly what they used to do. We remember the story of, I'm not going to go too far here, Brother Luke, but the the uh, the idols that uh, Rachel, I think Rachel had stolen um, when she uh, went away with Jacob and took some of the idols with her, the house of idols. And, and that's what that's referring to, the smaller idols that you take with it. And there was, there was some, there was some uh, argument about that. But, uh, yeah, that's what they used to do, and there's nothing in those. The only thing that we have to concentrate on is one thing, um, and he, he states in verse 6, but to us there is but one God, the Father, and whom all things, as Renee said, the creator of all things, which we all agree on, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given everything up for us, and is the way that we're reconciled to the Father through him. That's it. These idols do nothing for us. And then so the sacrificing, you know, food sacrifice, you're sacrificing to nothing. You're saying, even if you're sacrificing to a, to a devil, which you are, um, it still cannot compare to the glory of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let me ask either of you if you can explain to me uh, this distinction uh, when it says, uh, verse 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and, and then it says, And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Uh, <clears throat> but here it's saying that, that there's one God, the Father, mm -hmm. and there's one Lord, Jesus Christ. Can you... Uh, can you draw anything? Is there anything to be um, understood by referring to the Father as God, but Jesus as the as the Lord? Uh, does anybody know anything about that? Well, I, I was just going to say people try to uh, deny Jesus' divinity with verses like this, but that's easy to remedy, remedy when you realize God is three persons in the Godhead. Yeah. And he couldn't be... Jesus has to be God also because he did of whom are all things. So he created the world. So, um, and only God does that. So um, I, I think it's clearer when you see that, uh, that I think that, that Paul is, his main point isn't to deny the divinity of Jesus but is to remind them that he he is their Lord, he is uh, divine, and he is the one whom they should uh, revere and obey mm -hmm. and keep as an example. They, they're the ones that they should be subservient to. I just think he's um, reminding them of what he's done. I don't, I don't think it's a, a, to deny his divinity like most would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, uh, I don't know uh, how it, if it's uh, in Greek if the word Lord there is is uh, from kurios because uh, when when we see Jesus referred to as Lord and of course it's capitalized um, it should be understood that it's not Lord in terms of. He's your master. Right. You surrender your will over him. You obey right. him. He's your Lord. He lords over your life. Uh, but but Lord, kurios, and that Lord means God himself. Right, divine. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'd have to look it up to see. I'm assuming that's the way it is. But let's, let's look at the, there's a footnote in the NABRE on this. Let's see what that says. On verse six, the footnote. I think reads, you're just reminding them that they're that the little g gods they sacrifice to aren't gods at all. 
I think that was more of the point of the verse. Yeah. Well, you know that uh, the um, capitalization, uh, a lot of people make a lot of the capitalization. Now, uh, in the KJV uh, and uh, other translations use that uh, and, and, try, and to, to communicate with us that if it's capitalized, uh, then it's referring to uh, God. And when it says Lord in a capital, it's referring to God. Or uh, when it says, uh, G, um, uh, if you look at the, K, the KJV, it's capitalizing. Uh, but to us, there is but one God capitalized. So that means one true God. Mm -hmm. Capital God, God, it means that's the true God. Um, but uh, yeah, let me see. Does it say anything about? Oh, yeah. Verse 5, it yeah. says, for... For though there be that are called gods, mm -hmm. that's not capitalized. Yeah. So it's saying that these are false gods. It's not the true God. Yeah. So it's not, it's not it also says lords, too. Yeah. So I think he is just trying to distinguish, hey, there's many lords and gods, but there's only one Lord and one God. I think yeah. that's his whole point. Yep. Yeah, that's but uh, let's look at the NIBRE's uh, footnote. But that's why he brings up Jesus as the Lord yeah. and God the Father as God, because he's saying there's there's only one God and one Lord, even though there's many gods and many lords. Mm -hmm. He's saying there's only one of each, okay. and then he confirms who those people are. All right, let me read the uh, uh, footnote in the NIBRE on verse 6. It says, this verse rephrases the monotheistic confession of verse 4 in uh, such a way as to con contrast it with polytheism uh, in verse uh, 5. Um, and, and to express our relationship with the one God, capitalized, in concrete, uh, such as in personal and Christian terms. And for whom we exist... Uh, since the Greek contains no verb here and the action intended must be inferred from the preposition EIS, another translation is equally possible, quote, toward whom we return, unquote, and through whom all things means the earliest reference in the New Testament to Jesus's role in creation. Mm. Yes, well, I, I hope that everybody understood those points uh as as you read it anyway yeah. um but i'll read it again in the in the in the amplified because it really is uh, i think it does amplify very well in this case um verse uh four five and six in this matter then of eating food offered to idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world uh, it has no real existence and that there is no god but one for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things that have been created. And we, believers, exist and have life and have been redeemed through him. Yeah. So, Cripps, what do you think of uh, their amplification on on that that case? Yeah, yeah, it 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 gets it done. I'm, you know, I get it from from verse five when he's just in in lowercase lords. He's saying there there are many. I like that it says so called though. So called puts it out there in the amplified. So called because uh, for us as believers in the one true God, uh, we know the true nature of all these other idols. They're 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 so called gods. Yeah. Uh, but they're not the God. They're not the Lord. So, yeah, uh, I, yeah there's there's nothing else I can add to that. I think this is a, a good place for us to stop since yeah. because of the time. Yeah, Jim, has, uh, Jim has to be uh, up at five thirty in the morning. So okay. it, yeah, yeah. it's all right. Up. So let's 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 finish close it off here, ending at verse six. We'll pick up with verse seven next time. Okay. Uh, Cripps asked a question that I mean, not Cripps, um, Hendrix asked a question he said then he repeated i hope luke get, answers my question so let's let's go to that very quickly he says um does the amplified define uh, chapter 8 verse 3 he's love by first corinthians 13's definition of love well you know f f uh, chapter 13 is referred to as the love chapter 
So when we get to that, uh, we'll see a really uh, an entire ch chapter dedicated to explaining this love. Uh, but um, Hendrix, I, I, I can't jump ahead and, and, and um, I, I, I'll have to go when we get to chapter 13, we can maybe if we can remember, we can go back to eight verse three and see if they are consistent because uh, the issue here in verse three is that love somehow um, uh, associated with love is obedience. But I don't think obedience will, we'll see. We'll have to see if the Amplified uh, puts in obedience in chapter 13 as well. So Crips, hold on to your britches. <laughs> we're not gonna jump five chapters ahead yet. So uh, when I was a kid, does that mean I didn't love my mom when I disobeyed her? You don't love your mother. Now you understand. That's why That's why you got in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, that's just silly to say that, you know, uh, uh, love is obedience. Because that's that's not. I know my son loves me, but he doesn't listen to me. Yeah. Okay. Renee, I'm sorry. That was an attempt at humor on my part. I, I know. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's each take a minute now and kind of summarize our thoughts on the study tonight, uh, Brother Cripps. Yeah, yeah, I'll make it really short uh, uh, since uh, Renee has to get going. You have something to talk to her about. Um, so just really simply, I think he's uh, made some good points. We started with the marriage stuff. We got we got through all that and making the point that. Um, that you know, if you if if you can go without marrying, go ahead and and don't get married because you can serve the Lord better. Um, but if you do get married, it's not sin. That's that's pretty simple. And then of course in this chapter, we we're able to move on to a new chapter. And this one, I'm um, just talking about the idols and stuff. And again, Paul coming back to the point which I want to make anytime I can, which is that we have one Lord Jesus Christ, and we have reconciliation to God through Him. That's all that's important. All this other stuff is temporal stuff. All the things that people argue about, it's pointless. If we understand this point and we believe this the, this idea, it's more than an idea, it's truth. We believe that truth, then uh, we, we don't have anything else to fear. That's it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, Renee. Yeah, uh, I, I see a, uh, he moved from the carnal things of the world into spiritual things and all they work together uh it's important and what i'll take from this tonight is uh one you can never lose with compassion selflessness and love loving some somebody showing them compassion and love is never wrong never wrong you can you can't go wrong with that but you can with knowledge with how much you know. It's not, trust me, it's never impressive. You're not impressing people when you know so much and don't show them the uh, compassion and love. I'm telling you, love and compassion and caring speak so much louder than you know anything you could know or memorize. But uh, just uh, remember the things of this world, God does bless them with us. You know, we, uh, we can enjoy the things of this world but just know that everything here is fleeting it's it's not gonna last forever but there is something that will last forever and that is eternal life with christ and he offers that as a free gift and we should keep that the focus of our yes. life then we can have a joy and peace even in the things of the world yes renee thank you mm -hmm. yes yeah well I, I just sum up by saying that uh uh, there's a lot of good practical stuff in the, the um, beginning of the study, closing out chapter seven, that, that would be practical for the people who are in that situation in regarding uh, married, being married or not married and ministry and all that. Uh, so uh, you study that and apply it. Uh, but what got me, really got my attention was in, in chapter eight, when he starts talking about uh, being full of knowledge and puff, being puffed up and lack of love. And that's the practical part that, that I'm, <laughs> that applies to me today as far as, as what, what I'm witnessing yeah. um, uh, here on YouTube. There are a lot of people that are all puffed up thinking that they got it all figured out. And <laughs> but what I see is an absence of love. 
Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, an announcement. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I'll be in uh, Cedar City, Utah uh, for a few days and, and uh, at a Shakespeare festival. I'm all excited about that. I will be back in time to have the Sunday service program, uh, but I will not be here for the F Fellowship Friday. But rather than uh, not having a Fellowship Friday, Brother Cripps has graciously agreed to, to fill in and host that. So um, make sure you join uh, Fellowship Friday. I assume it'll be the same time, 9.30 Eastern time. And uh, uh, I think everybody will have a great time uh, with uh, Brother Cripps and the rest of them on the, the panel. Um, I can't fill your shoes, Brother Luke, but I'll do the best I can to uphold the, the idea of fellowship. I promise that. Yes, awesome. I know you'll do, do well. Uh, okay. Um, Thank you everybody for participating, everybody in the chat room. And, and, and some of you may not have seen the video I made last week about me not uh, engaging in chat rooms or making comments in the future. So uh, if you, I hope you'll watch that video and then you'll understand why I'm not making comments and uh, so on. But uh, <clears throat> thank you for being there. And uh, thank you everybody uh, for participating. Oh, Brother Matthias, um, if you're listening now, I assume you are, if you wanna make any thought, closing thoughts for yourself, I, uh, you're certainly welcome to tell us what you thought of the talk tonight. Okay, maybe not, okay. <clears throat> all right then, thank you for participating. I'll see you next time. Bless you all in the name of our great savior God, Jesus.